Buenas tardes. Gusto tenerlos aquí. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos a celebrar los 36 años del Club de Investigación Tecnológica. Fue precisamente en abril de 1988 que nos reunimos por primera vez con representantes de unas 10 empresas diferentes en una oficina que nos prestaron en el ICE. Desde entonces, hemos estado haciendo nuestro mejor esfuerzo para estudiar las últimas tecnologías para beneficio de los afiliados. Hoy vamos a hablar de Internet. Y aprovecho, by the way, para agradecer a todos los que nos están siguiendo remotamente desde la casa, obviamente por Internet. Cuando empezamos el club, la Internet no existía. La Internet sí existía, pero la web no. La web la fuimos a conocer al envío. ¿Se acuerdan del envío? En 1994, creo. Y ese día, en una pantalla grande, vimos un browser, que no me acuerdo si era el Netscape o uno de esos. Visitamos como tres o cuatro sitios, utilizando un modem como de 48 audios. Y esa, a mí esa visita siempre me ha recordado Macondo, cuando fueron a conocer el hielo, porque fue así lo que sentimos. No sabíamos para qué servía, pero era wow, increíble. El primer informe de investigación que hicimos en el club está titulado Redes de Computadoras. Todo el mundo quería saber cómo es esa vaina de que computadoras le hablan a otras computadoras. En ese informe que terminé escribiendo yo, se explican los diferentes protocolos que se utilizaban en esa fecha para conectar computadoras. La gran mayoría eran protocolos propietarios, de manera que solo permitían comunicarse con otras computadoras de la misma marca. Si bien había un protocolo abierto llamado TCP/IP, los proveedores todos nos decían que era muy ineficiente. Actualmente el club cuenta con 38 afiliados empresariales e institucionales y con 819 afiliados personales. Todos los meses nos reunimos y los afiliados empresariales nos mandan uno o dos colaboradores cada uno, dependiendo del tema porque también tenemos un expositor invitado todos los meses. Los afiliados nos indican a través de votaciones cuáles son los temas de interés y nosotros hacemos lo propio para buscar expositores sobre esos temas. Los afiliados personales participan de las reuniones virtualmente. La semana pasada inventamos un nuevo tipo de afiliado, el afiliado personal plus que lo, también lo invitamos a desayunar. Ya llevamos tres de esos. En el club solo hay una regla. Es prohibido vender. Nosotros hablamos de tecnologías, pero no de marcas. Nosotros creemos que las ideas son para compartir. Por eso, tenemos 36 años de estar creando y compartiendo ideas de tecnología. Hace 14 años apareció la oportunidad de compartir ideas de todo tipo, más allá de la tecnología, y conseguimos la licencia de TEDx Pura Vida. El club y TEDx tienen en común el deseo de difundir ideas y conocimiento. Ahora quiero aprovechar para agradecer a los patrocinadores sin los cuales este evento no hubiera sido posible. GBM es una empresa líder en servicios de tecnología con el propósito de construir el futuro digital de los negocios. Son el aliado tecnológico que las empresas necesitan. Muchas gracias, GBM, por estar con nosotros desde el principio. BAC, BAC contribuye a la prosperidad e innovación del país a través de proyectos que promueven el desarrollo tecnológico como la actividad pasado, presente y futuro de la Internet en Costa Rica. Agradecemos a BAC su apoyo a este evento. Cisco ha sido un pionero crucial en la creación de Internet, destacándose por sus innovaciones tecnológicas, establecimiento de estándares globales y la fabricación de equipos esenciales. Muchas gracias, Cisco. Colby, la marca nacional líder en telecomunicaciones. También desde el primer día del club, no se llamaba Colby, el ICE ha estado con nosotros. Liberty es una empresa de telecomunicaciones comprometida con la innovación, el intercambio de ideas, que entiende que la conectividad es clave para desbloquear el potencial de la sociedad. Muchas gracias a Liberty, además un nuevo afiliado muy reciente. UFINET es el proveedor neutral de fibra más grande de toda Latinoamérica. 
Gracias por formar parte. Es la primera vez que nos apoyan y esperamos que no sea la última. Liberty es una empresa de telecomunicaciones. Ya se me confundió todo, ¿verdad? Telecable, gracias a Telecable, el cable de los ticos por ser parte de este evento. Ufinet, ya les había dicho. Y el Museo de los Niños. Es para nosotros un honor llevar a cabo este evento en el Teatro Auditorio Nacional del Museo de los Niños, institución benemérita que en este mes de abril cumple 30 años de ser un pilar de la educación, la cultura, el fomento de valores y el sano entretenimiento para más de 9 millones y medio de visitantes. Muchas gracias por recibirnos. Veamos ahora unos videos cortitos de los patrocinadores. Los seres humanos hemos soñado con poderes. Dejemos de soñar, porque ¿no es acaso un poder comunicarte con cientos de drones a la vez? ¿O saber la posición y el consumo de su flota en tiempo real? ¿Que las cámaras de vigilancia dejen de solo grabar y empiecen a identificar? ¿O que las máquinas nos indiquen cuándo iniciar su mantenimiento? Por eso, en Liberty Empresas introducimos la primera red IoT de Costa Rica. Experimente el verdadero poder del IoT. A hacker doesn't always look like a hacker. A hacker is at home, everywhere. A hacker comes in many forms. He's interested in everything. He can work alone. But with a crew. So much better. A hacker is free. With Cisco, protecting your business from cyber attackers is simple. If it's connected, you're protected. Somos más que una compañía tecnológica. Somos dinámicos. Somos los que mueven industrias. Somos impulso. Somos los que transformamos día a día. Somos audaces. Somos los que ofrecemos soluciones a la medida. Somos atrevidos. Somos los que construimos el mañana. Somos imparables. Somos los que evolucionamos para no quedarnos atrás. Somos futuro. Somos los que crecemos desde adentro. Somos equipo. Somos los que siempre enfrentamos nuevos desafíos. Somos GBM. Which allows us to help the growth of all type of customers and partners that require a highly available fiber solution in the region. Being a neutral partner has allowed other carriers to rely on Ufinet as we don't compete naturally with them in these markets. We don't have a corporate business unit. So this has helped us uh, to focus even more on the specific needs that certain wholesale carriers need in the region. Ufinet is the first operator to connect through a terrestrial network, the south part of Mexico, all the way to Panama, Colombia, and going down south to Peru. And now even expanding to new geographies like Santiago de Chile, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, providing other services such as hardware as a service, remote hands, 
So it's your gateway, cloud connectivity, among others, as also being able us to provide this type of whole solutions to our customers. Ahora sí, a lo que vinimos. Me faltó mencionar antes, el club de investigación nunca ha tenido podio. Este podio es reciclable, biodegradable, desarmable y pesa 3 kilos. Eh, realmente fue una sorpresa muy agradable que tuve hace como un mes que me invitaron a dar una charla para Corrugados Altavista y tenían uno exactamente igual con otro logo. Entonces, les dije que quería comprar uno, me lo regalaron, estaba listo el día siguiente. Se desarma en un paquetico así, es, es algo increíble. Realmente quiero agradecer a Corrugados Altavista, el diseño me parece genial, fantástico. Bueno, esto es lo que vamos a hacer hoy. Primero, vamos a oír a David McCord. David es el fundador y presidente de Graham McCord Capital y presidente del National Broadband Ireland. Ha sido uno de los inversores y empresarios más destacados de la industria de tecnología, medios y telecomunicaciones durante los últimos 30 años. Ha fundado o comprado más de 20 empresas de tecnología, medios y telecomunicaciones en nueve países y es ampliamente reconocido como una fuerza transformadora en el espacio de las telecomunicaciones. The Economist lo describe como el poseedor de credenciales impecables como revolucionario de las telecomunicaciones. Como propietario y presidente de National Broadband Ireland, McCord trabaja actualmente en asociación con el gobierno irlandés y la mayor asociación público-privada de telecomunicaciones europeas para implementar el Plan Nacional de Banda Ancha del país por un valor de 5 mil millones de euros. A nivel mundial, se trata de la mayor inversión jamás realizada por intervención gubernamental en infraestructura de telecomunicaciones y se la considera ampliamente como el despliegue de banda ancha más ambicioso del mundo para re revitalizar las comunidades rurales, rurales y detener la creación de divisiones socioeconómicas. Con ustedes, David. Thank you, Roberto. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lo siento, no hablo español. Excuse. Roberto asked me to speak slowly, but I don't think he understands that I'm the youngest in a family of nine, and that wasn't my weapon of choice growing up, but I'll do, I'll do my best. Um, 
I'm humbled, actually, to be standing in a country that for 75 years has had no army. And on behalf of every peaceful warrior in the world, thank you. I'm also uh, honored to be part of your, your club that's been around for a long time. There aren't any other clubs like this in the world, as best, best I can see, that gets together to share ideas and share best practices. I'm here to talk about Ireland, and Ireland is a country much like Costa Rica. We're about the same size. We have about the same amount of people. We both have a rainy season. Ours has just been going for 100 years. <laughs> and the project that Roberto wants me to talk about is our National Broadband Ireland, which is the largest public-private partnership in Europe. It's the largest public-private partnership in telecom in the world, we believe. And the objective of the project is to wire every man, woman, and child in Ireland. So every home, every hospital, every school, every farm, every business will get a fiber optic cable. And to give you an idea of the scale of that project, we string enough fiber to go from New York to LA every eight weeks. When the project is over, we'll have strung enough cable to go around the world four times. And it's an open access wholesale network, which means we charge everyone the same price, and it only takes a matter of days to connect to the network, and anyone can connect to the network. In our case, we have 66 global and regional phone and internet companies connected to our network companies you would have heard of, like Telefonica, British Telecom, AT&T, Virgin Mobile, Virgin Media, Vodafone. And those companies deliver services to the companies in Ireland and the people of Ireland. Now, why is open access wholesale a good idea? Because it means that everybody in Ireland has 66, because that's how many companies are on our network, 66 choices. And by having 66 choices, you get a lower cost of service, you get better service, and you get more innovation. And because it's a state-of-the-art network, it's the best-run network in Europe. And we have the statistics to back that up. As the engineers in the room know, customer service is measured a net promoter score. The average in the telecom industry is between negative 30 and positive 30. Our connections net promoter score is 92. The RSPs on our network have a net promoter score in the mid 50s. In an industry that has trouble getting to zero, and just as we started this project, Oxford University did a study, and they measured 22,000 projects, multi-billion dollar projects like ours, in 195 countries. And they found out that only half of 1% are on time, on budget, and deliver policy. And I'm proud to say we're on time, we're under budget, and we're delivering policy. And the part I'm most proud of is in our contract, we put a provision where after we made a fair profit, we'd give 50% of it back to the taxpayers. We deemed 15% to be a fair profit. So anything above that, we give 50% back to the people of Ireland. We've given 46 million euros back so far and we expect to give 200 million euros back by the time the project is done. That's what capitalism used to look like, that's what it should look like, and it's what it looks like to us. It took 10 years for that project to get off the ground. It had fierce political infighting, mostly for self-serving reasons, but it persevered. And I'm, I'm not a politician, I'm a media and telecom guy. I was lucky enough 40 years ago to invent a method, a new method of designing and installing cable systems. 
that's saved people 80%. That system is now the norm in all cable systems, design and construction around the world. I then built and owned America's first competitive facilities-based telecom company, a company called Corporate Communications Network. We then merged that little company, which grew into a big company, actually, and played a, a role in transforming the telecom industry. And we merged that little company into another company called MFS, and we created MFS McCourt. Then we later merged MFS into another company called MCI WorldCom in a $14.5 billion transaction. And strangely enough, that's when Vint and I ended up in the same building, eating at the same restaurants, socializing with the same people. And for almost 40 years, we never ran into each other until recently. And that's how life works, because I ran into Vint at exactly the right time for what I'm doing now, which is what I think is my life's most important work. We also produce, in addition to being in telecom, we produce TV and documentaries, documentaries about issues that we think are important for the world, but we think are misunderstood. But back, back to the network. Um, this, this network, and, and if you think for a minute, if you think for a minute, about what gave countries power from the Industrial Revolution up to about 50 years ago. It was one of two things. It was either you had natural resources, hopefully fossil fuels, or you had a lot of people. If you had a lot of people, you could get them to work on your plantation or in your factory, and they could make widgets, and they could put them in boxes, and they could put those boxes in crates, and those crates in big containers and those containers on ships. And that would give them industrial power in usually exploiting people with an unfair wage. Or if you were lucky enough to have fossil fuels like coal or oil or gas, you could use those fossil fuels to power steel mills or factories. And that would give you big and powerful industrial strength as a country, but often exploiting the environment. That's how power was gained and wielded in the old world. But the point is that those advantages are of diminishing power going forward. Small countries like Ireland and Costa Rica can now play a bigger role. With big countries are getting smaller, small countries need to get bigger. We're entering a new world, a new tech revolution. Before Vint and his colleagues invented the internet, your geography was your destiny. Where you stood physically mattered. In the new world order, startups can come from San Jose, they can come from Dublin, or they can come from Hanoi. And with small countries educate their people, give them internet access and digital literacy. People can build a business and build a life for themselves anywhere in the world. And we've entered into an economy that some people call the economy of the mind. But the economy of the mind needs to be connected to the machine. And that's clear and that's irreversible. The new world order that's going to change everything about how we live, how we work, how we communicate, and how we govern needs to be humanity-led. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be in Costa Rica. Because Costa Rica has led by example around forest reform. In 1988, you had 30% of your country covered with forest. You now have 58%. And no matter how you look at that, that's revolutionary. It's best in the class. It's best in the world. And it was done from the bottom up. It was done with a small tax on transportation users to solve the problem. You've done it. You've done your part. And now it's the rest of us. It's our job to make sure the free riders do their part. And by free riders, I don't mean someone who needs to cut down a tree to heat their home or feed their family. I mean companies that 
value profit, their profit, more than our environment. And I use this example, and I think it's a relevant example, is as we enter the world of AI and quantum computing, it's critical that we have the bottom and the top working together. It's in fashion nowadays to criticize big tech. It's a thing that politicians like to do. In the last 90 days, I've been to Washington, I've been to Downing Street, I've been to Silicon Valley, and I can promise you only two of those are dysfunctional. Big tech is not perfect by any means. And we can debate whether it was the Romans or the Nazis or the tobacco industry that invented fake news, but it wasn't Silicon Valley. They need to do more, that's true. We need to put guardrails up, that's true. But technology is going to be our solution for cheaper education, for cheaper health care, and for a cleaner environment. So we have to embrace it. Small countries like Costa Rica and Ireland can work together to solve these problems. We have 16 of the 20 biggest tech companies in the world headquartered in Ireland, and we need to use that proximity to get them to work with us. What we don't want to do is make the mistakes that the music industry made. The music industry was a $25 billion industry. Tech started to revolutionize that industry, and they fought it. They fought it for a decade. They sued 30,000 individuals for streaming music, and they turned into a $12 billion industry from a $25 billion industry. Now they've embraced technology, and they're a $35 billion industry. Perhaps they would have been a $50 billion industry. And, w and they still haven't solved the nagging problem that industry has, which is how to get more money in the hands of small artists. That's where their efforts should have been, in my opinion. And I know I'm painting with broad brush, brokes, broad brush strokes. That's hard in English. It must be terrible in Spanish. But I only have 15 minutes, and I'm trying to get a lot of points across. But the number one point is we need to embrace technology. Regulate it, yes. Demand transparency, yes. And most importantly, demand fairness. But fighting is not going to get us there. I've been in business with the same partner for 40 years, and 90% of the things we do is in partnership with other companies or countries. And I can't think of one example where I got my way by fighting. I got my, wife, my way by laying out the problem and the concerns in working with everyone. Let me end by giving you some context of why this is important. Because this world that we all share is about to move very fast. When Vince Cerf and his colleagues invented the internet, would he spend a million dollars on? On speed, capacity, flexibility, storage, any way you want to measure it. Would Vince spend a million dollars on today is less than a dollar? That's the fastest increase in pricing power in any industry in the history of mankind. But looking forward, that's what we'd call in Ireland small potatoes. Because it's not going to be a million to one looking forward. It's going to be more like a billion to one. Data from different sources, different languages, different formats, all making sense, all coming together to predict an outcome. It's a remarkable time to be alive to use this technology to solve our problems. Let me give you some more context of how technology is everywhere in our lives. If you were to buy an automobile today, 50% of the value of that automobile is in software, not metal, not rubber. The turn of the century, 40% of Americans worked on farms. Today, it's less than 2%. It's about 1.5%. But yet, there's 400% more output. And that's the slowest industry, slowest moving industry from a technological standpoint in America. Old computers operate on rules. Newer computers operate on examples. All facts in all countries and all languages to help predict the future. If you had someone you loved and they had a 
lump on their shoulder or on their breast? Would you rather have one tired radiologist read that? Or would you rather have a computer that's read a billion, that knows the outcome of half a million people with that same diagnosis? Of course, it would need to be checked by a human. But that's the power of technology. Today, in your newspaper, I read this morning that there's a backlog of imaging. I was in your local hospital yesterday, and I saw the backlog. I saw people three rows deep in the, in the halls on stretchers waiting to be cared for. And it wasn't because the doctors weren't working hard. The men and women there were working very hard. It's because we all have a limited budget and a limited amount of real estate in our hospitals, and we need to embrace technology to speed up that process and bring the waiting times down. If you could imagine for a minute that we all could be born in two different places at the same time. Imagine, because I'm an American and an Irishman, imagine I was born in America and I was born in Ireland. And in both cases, my children wanted elite jobs. They wanted to be lawyers or doctors or scientists. If I could, in my life in America, if I had enough money to send them to a good school and got them into a good university that takes a lot of money, they wouldn't have to work. If I was wealthy, they wouldn't have to work. During the summer, they could study and they could get into the best medical schools and the best law schools. When they became doctors, they could heal people, but they could also have an income that gave them a lifestyle that we all want. If I was born and I raised a family at that same time, in my example, in Ireland, in a, and I worked on a farm, and my kids were just as smart, just as compassionate, just as driven, but they had to get up at 4.30 every morning to work on the farm with me, and I couldn't afford to send them to university. But they still wanted to be doctors. And what does a doctor do? A doctor diagnoses a problem, prescribes a treatment, and then hopefully has time to hold your hand and explain to you it's going to be all right and comfort you. If that child, that girl that we're talking about that was born on a farm, had AI that could help her so she could diagnose problems, she could recommend treatment, and she had time and compassion to hold your hand, could we just for this example call her a doctor? And just for this example, could we pay her like a doctor? That's technology bringing up the bottom. That's technology helping people on the bottom get closer to people on the top. We don't know how many Martin Luther Kings or Madame Curies there are that with technology would have a chance to solve our problems that we all share. But we need connectivity. We need digital learning. We did a study at University of Southern California, Ron the Economist in residence, with Columbia, and we did it in Uruguay. And we took rural areas and we fibered them in one area and didn't fire them in another, fiber them. And after five years, we measured employment. Those where we fired, fibered, pardon me, those that had jobs ended up making more money, and those that didn't have jobs still didn't have jobs. Because it's not just the fiber, it's the dig digital literacy. It's the things, the programs you put on top of the connectivity. We need to harness that power to stop fake news, divisiveness, and poverty. We need guardrails on technology, of course. We need to make them transparent. We need to make them responsible. And more importantly, we need to make them act fairly. Small countries like yours that have already led on the environment need to take the lead. Big countries like the United States used to lead around the world. They used to flatten the world to make it a fairer place. They leaned into every organization that was trying to make the world a fairer place. The UN, the World Bank, no tariffs, taking down barriers. Big countries now put up more barriers than they take down. A 
fairer, flatter world is also a safer world. So we all need to lead now. All the thinkers, all the doers, all the dreamers, we need to lead. We have a moment in time, and we need to seize it. For 100 years, small countries followed big countries. Now it's time for them to follow us. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you, David. Muchas gracias, David. Muchas gracias. Este QR, este, si lo escanean, los va a llevar a un lugar donde pueden plantear preguntas. Vamos a tener un panel después de que Vinto nos dé su charla. Y este, también pueden hacer preguntas de papel y tenemos gente que las recoja y me las traiga. Yo quería hacer todas las preguntas de papel, pero tenemos un montón de gente siguiéndonos de manera remota y era un tanto difícil hacer llegar esos pedazos de papel. Por lo tanto, pusimos aquí el slide, ojalá todos puedan participar y hacer preguntas. Ahora tengo el gusto, realmente un honor, de presentar a Vinton Surf. Vint es vicepresidente y evangelista jefe de Internet en Google. Es codiseñador de los protocolos TCP y IP y la arquitectura de Internet. Ha ocupado puestos ejecutivos en ICANN, en Internet Society, en MCI, la Corporación para las Iniciativas de Investigación Nacional y la Agencia de Proyectos de Investigación Avanzada de Defensa. Es ex profesor de Stanford, ex miembro de la Junta Nacional de Ciencias de Estados Unidos. También fue presidente de la Asociación for Computing Machinery. Desempeña funciones de asesoramiento en NIST, en DOE, NSF, US Navy, JPL, NRO. Obtuvo su bachillerato en matemáticas en Stanford y la maestría de doctorado en ciencias de la computación en UCLA. Es miembro de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias e Ingeniería de Estados Unidos, de la Worshipful Company of Information Technologies and the Worshipful Company of Stationers. Surf ha recibido numerosos premios por su trabajo, incluida la medalla del Presidente de la Libertad de Estados Unidos, la medalla nacional de tecnología de Estados Unidos, el premio de la Reina Isabel, el de Ingeniería, el Premio del Príncipe de Asturias, el Premio Japón, el Premio Charles Stark Draper, ACM Turing Award, el Premio Marconi, el Premio Marconi Lifetime Achievement Award, la Medalla de Honor de la IEEE, la Legión de Honor, el Gran Premio de Vin Futures y la Medalla de Franklin. El miembro extranjero, yo no sabía que esto existía, miembro extranjero de la sociedad, del Royal Society en the UK y de la Academia Sueca de Ingeniería, Posee 29 títulos honoríficos. A mí, cuando yo leí esto, es realmente impresionante. Señores, les presento a Vinton Surf. Wow. So, do I have uh, my controls? Yes. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes, señores y señoras. And I'm afraid that's all the Spanish I can give you. I apologize for that. This is English language uh, training, I think, for many of you tonight. Thank you for your patience and, uh, and your willingness to put up with it. I'm going to try to take you on a 70-year journey from about 1970 or so to 2030 in 45 minutes. So let's begin. In 1969, the American Defense Department was paying about a dozen universities to do research in artificial intelligence. We're talking more than 50 years ago. It was a hot topic then, and it's a hot topic now. Every one of those universities said to the Defense Department, you need to buy us a new computer every year so we can do world-class research. And even DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, couldn't afford to buy a new computer for 12 universities every year. So they said, we're going to build a network and you're going to share. 
and everybody hated that. But they said, we're building the network so you can share your resources. And they also said very cleverly, we're going to fund all of you. So don't hide your work to try to have an advantage in a competition. Share everything with your colleagues so we can advance the state of the art as quickly as we can. Now, in addition to that motivation of resource sharing, they decided that they needed to find a better technology for allowing computers to communicate with each other. The traditional way of doing that was called the telephone system, and it used a technology called circuit switching. Can you imagine a computer dialing up another computer, waiting until the other computer picks up the phone, sends some data, and then hangs up and then dials another computer? It's too slow. So instead, they decided to use a technology which all of you, I, sure, I am sure, know about called packet switching, which is basically like electronic postcards, but they run about 100 million times faster than the post office. So we built this little four-node network. I was a graduate student at UCLA at the time, and uh, the Sigma 7 computer was the one that I was responsible for to build software to measure the performance of the network. The Sigma 7 computer is in a museum somewhere. Some people think I should be along in, at the museum, but <laughs> here I am. So this was the first packet switch network of any scale. There were only four nodes. This was 1969. Now let's see what happens. That was a packet switch in 1969. It was the size of a refrigerator. <clears throat> it was a Honeywell DDP 516 computer. But it only cost about $100,000 at the time, which was much less expensive than those million dollar machines in the air conditioned rooms. Now, you might think that all we were doing was using dedicated telephone circuits to connect the packet switches to each other and connect the computers to the packet switches. But remember, this was the Defense Department. And what were they thinking? They were thinking computers might be useful in command and control. If I could use a computer to manage my resources better than the opponent, I might be able to defeat a bigger component because I did a better job of managing my resources. But if you think about command and control in a military context, you can't use telephone wires to connect the tanks to each other because they run over the wires and they break. You can't connect the ships at sea with wires because the ships get all tangled up. And the airplanes would never make it off the tarmac if they had wires attached to them. So we started experimenting with radio communication, digital radio communication, in the early 1970s. This was a truck that was built by SRI International in Menlo Park, California. And we had packet radios inside. Let me show you a picture of that. Those white boxes, there were four of them. They were about a cubic foot. They cost $50,000 each. That was a packet radio of the day. It was able to transmit at 100 kilobits a second and 400 kilobits a second, which at the time was actually pretty good compared to a dial-up modem that might go at 2,400 bits a second. So we were experimenting with mobile digital radio communication along with that ARPANET. Then we decided, you know, command and control, let's see what happened here. There we go. Command and control often involves voice and data. And so we were experimenting with packetized voice in the early 1970s. And you can see the fancy Walt Disney telephone that we used there in the bottom. Uh, so we were experimenting with packet voice and, by the way, also packet video in the early 1970s, mid-1970s. Mid, uh, 
And of course today we do this sort of thing all the time without even thinking about it. But this was 50 years ago. So we were already thinking about these possibilities. Oh, I do have to tell you a funny story. The backbone speeds of the network range from 50 kilobits a second in the ARPANET to 100 or 400 kilobits a second in the radio net. Now, if you know a little bit about digitizing voice, you know that in the telephone network, a voice stream is 64 kilobits a second. And if all you have is a 50 kilobit channel, you can't put very much voice into it. So we had to use an algorithm for compressing the voice from 64 kilobits all the way down to 1800 bits per second. We used a technology called linear predictive code with 10 parameters. It modeled the voice tract as if it were a stack of cylinders whose diameter was changing as the voice was speaking. So you would send that information to the other side and they would invert the transformation and play out the voice. Now I have to tell you, when you convert a 64 kilobit voice stream down to 1800 bits a second, you lose some of the quality. So anyone who talked through this system sounded like a drunken Norwegian. <laughs> so ar around this time, I have moved from Stanford University where I was working to uh, Washington DC to run the program for ARPA. And they asked me to demonstrate the packet voice system to a bunch of generals at the Pentagon. And I'm thinking, okay, how am I gonna do this? And then I remembered that one of the researchers in the project was Ingvar Lund from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So we had Ingvar talk through the switched voice network of the Defense Department, Autobahn. Then we had him talk through our packet voice system and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> we didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound that way. So in 1977, we had three packet switch networks in operation. One of them was the mobile radio network that we showed you, the big truck. And then there was a packet satellite system over the Atlantic, which we would use for ships to talk to each other, ship to ship and ship to shore. And we had the ARPANET, which looks like the giant amoeba that's swallowing the packet satellite network, it, was, it had reached all the way through an internal satellite hop into Europe by the time this experiment was done. So this was an experiment to show three packet switch networks that were all different. Different speeds, different addressing structures, different packet formats, uh, different delays, error rates. And we wanted to show that they could all be made to interwork in a uniform way using the protocols, TCP and IP. So this was our first experiment. We had the packet radio van was driving up and down the Bayshore Freeway in San Francisco, radiating packets that went all the way through the ARPANET to Norway and Sweden, and then down to London, to University College London. And then it hopped out of the ARPANET into the packet satellite net and went all the way back to the United States on the East Coast and rejoined the ARPANET and then went all the way to Los Angeles, to University of Southern California. Now, San Francisco and Los Angeles are 400 miles apart, but there were two geosynchronous satellite hops in the system, so the packets went 100,000 miles before they got to Los Angeles, and it worked. And I remember being in my office in Washington when this demonstration was done and I was hopping up and down saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly work. It's software. And you know it's a miracle when software works. <laughs> so that was a very important milestone in the history of internet. The other parts of the US government that were performing or supporting research saw what ARPA had done and decided that they wanted to do the same thing. 
And so the National Science Foundation said, we have 3,000 universities and we want to connect them to the five supercomputer centers that NSF and the Department of Energy were building. And so they decided to adopt the internet technology and build their own backbone network, the NSF net. And then they very cleverly said, this technology allows different networks to be interconnected. So let's build another dozen networks to serve groups of universities in the US. So the people who were running the NSF net backbone only had 12 customers and the intermediate level network served the rest of the universities. So that was the National Science Foundation. The Department of Energy has laboratories scattered around the US and they said we should connect them together in order to do our work. And so they built their own energy services or energy sciences network, ESnet. And not to be undone, NASA, which has laboratories around the US, said we need to have a network to connect them together. So we will build the NASA Science Internet. They all decided to use TCP IP so they could be compatible with each other and they were all interconnected. So by the mid, mid to late 1980s, we had four major backbone networks and lots and lots of computers all interconnected on this government sponsored computer network. Now, there's one little problem with the government sponsorship. They said, we don't want any commercial traffic on the government sponsored backbones. This is purely for research, it's purely for government purposes. And so around 1988, I was beginning to wonder, how is the private sector ever going to get access to this technology? How is the general public going to get access to the technology? And I went to the Federal Networking Council, which makes policy for the internet in those days, and I asked them if I could do an experiment. Now, you have to imagine for a moment the, the, the uh, rule that said no commercial traffic was called appropriate use policy. And the only appropriate use was government contractors and researchers. But I had designed a commercial system for a company called MCI, called MCI Mail. It was a commercial email service. And so I asked for permission to connect the MCI Mail commercial system up to the internet as, a, as an experiment to see if I could get them to enter work. Well, of course I could get them to enter work. I designed both of them so I knew how to do that. But the whole point was to break the appropriate use policy. So to my complete astonishment, the government said, okay, you can do that. So in 1989, I announced that we had interconnected the commercial MCI mail system with the internet. And as soon as we made that announcement, all of the other commercial email services said, wait a minute, we want to have access to this system too. So OnTime and Telemail and CompuServe and a number of other commercial email services insisted on getting connected to the internet and the US government gave them permission to do that. So why is this important? Well, the first thing is, that every one of those commercial email services, which were little islands that didn't communicate with anybody except the people on the island, could suddenly communicate with each other through the internet. So all the customers of MCI Mail could talk to all the customers of Telemail or CompuServe. And of course, this was quite a shock for the people that thought they had a control over their customer base. The same year, 1989, three commercial internet services got started. One of them was called UUNet, one of them was called PSINet, and another fourth one, third one was called SurfNet out in California. So this is what the internet looks like today. Now I'm cheating a little because actually, to be honest, that picture was generated in 1999, but it was such a pretty picture, I'm still using it. The, the reason I'm, I want to draw your attention to it, though, is that each one of the colors is a different network. There's 50,000 networks all interconnected. Here's what's amazing about it. The interconnections are often on a handshake deal. No contracts. The agreement is, I'll carry your traffic if you carry mine. 
So some 80% of these are just handshake agreements. Second, it all interworks, and there's no central control. And the only reason that works is they all decided to use the same technology. They could pick which router vendors they were going to use. They could pick whose software they're going to use. As long as everybody followed the protocols of the TCP IP suite, it would interwork. And so today, we have all of those networks interconnected with each other, all functioning in the way that you experience every day. The scale of the system has gone up by about a factor of 10 million. The number of users, the number of computers on the network has gone up by, and the speeds of the system have gone from the original 50 kilobits a second to backbone speeds on the order of 400 gigabits a second per channel in the optical fiber network. That's quite a big span, and it's a tribute to the architecture of the system that could grow over that period of time. Now, in addition to the technology, it turned out that as this project went along and as it became a commercial enterprise, we discovered that we had to create institutions as part of the governance of the system. So, uh, in 1979, when I'm still at ARPA with my colleague Bob Kahn, who helped co-invent this system, uh, he said to me, what happens if you get hit by a bus? And I said, well, I'd probably get killed. And he said, well, that's the point. I don't want all that stuff in your head to go away, so you need to create some kind of a, an organization that will uh, gather all the information about the project in one place. And so we invented something called the Internet Configuration Control Board. We wanted it to sound as boring as possible so no one would want to be on it. And then I assigned the people who were leading the projects, the engineers, to be on that board. That has become, over the years, the Internet Architecture Board. We've also invented something called the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Internet Research Task Force, where the standards are being created. We had to invent the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers in order to manage the domain name system and the Internet address allocation. We had to internet, in, invent regional Internet registries to allocate IP address space to uh, network service providers. We had to invent the Internet Society in order to support the Internet Engineering Task Force standards making work. Every single time when we have discovered a need for an institution, we've invented one. But we did it only when it was clear we needed to do that. And so this literally has been an evolving system over time, and it continues to evolve. And what's interesting is that the entities that make up this ecosystem have sometimes not always exactly aligned interests. And so it's a very loosely coupled environment. And for those of you who are engineers, I can tell you designing loosely coupled systems is smart because when things start to change, you want flexibility in the interaction of the various components. You don't want rigid systems where if you pull out one nail, the whole thing falls apart. So uh, this sort of loose coupling design has been very important. So it has been an extraordinarily diverse environment, and those of you who read the headlines today will know that there are new parties that have an interest in internets, yours, mine, and others, um, the uh, judicial system, the legislative system, all want to have something to say about how the internet is used by people like you and me and companies. So lots of people have an interest in the internet. I've already mentioned this web of informal relationships. What's really hard about uh, the internet governance question is that the internet, when we designed it, didn't know anything about countries and about country boundaries. And that was deliberate. Think about it for a minute. We're designing a command and control network for the American Defense Department. And can you imagine, if we had used the telephone system and postal system 
um, addressing mechanism so that, you know, Costa Rica has its address space and America has its address space, uh, just like country codes. And suppose that now you're, you have a military operation and, and you're going to have to invade country X. So you don't want to have to go to country X two weeks before the invasion and say, uh, excuse me, can I get some address space from you because we're going to invade you in a couple of weeks and our command and control system won't work without addresses in your country. That's a non-starter. So we designed the system to be completely topologically con connected but with no country codes. Now it's true in the domain name world there are country codes, but that's in the next layer up in the system. Now why do I tell you that? It's because the packets of the internet don't know when they've crossed a country boundary. It is completely global in scope, by design, deliberately by design. So the problem now is that when you try to set policy, and policies are based on uh, geopolitical boundaries, the packets are crossing into different territory, different jurisdictional territory, uh, without knowing it. And so until we get collaboration and cooperation among countries, to set internet policy, we're going to have a hard time making all this work. And so you can imagine what's going on in the United Nations and in the Internet Governance Forum is a lot of discussion about how to have coherent and compatible policy that works across the globe for internet's use and operation. So, so far, the internet has been running since January 1st, 1983. We started the design work in 1973. It took us 10 years to get to the point where we could turn it on, and it's been running ever since. And I've already talked about this transnational challenge that we have. So where are we going with all this? Well, the first observation is computers are everywhere. They're in your pocket, they're in your house, they're in the car. Uh, they are literally everywhere, and they are of varying sizes and shapes. Some of them are in your pockets, and some of them are on the desk. Some of them occupy big spaces and big buildings like data centers. And we have communications technology, which has evolved, especially for mobile communications, 3 and 4G, now 5G and 6G. And Wi-Fi, which, by the way, is, has moved away from its original origins, into uh, a much more disciplined access method, so it will be faster and lower latency than what you may have experienced in the past. And then there are these near short, uh, short radio communications like Bluetooth and near field cards. And then there's the Internet of Things, devices that are programmable that can communicate with each other over the Internet. David said something earlier about the importance of connectivity. I could not overemphasize for you that connectivity in the Internet world is literally everything. If everything is not connected, it doesn't work. And the nutshell example of that for you is a web page. Because if you think about how the web works, the web page, your, your computer downloads a, a file which contains instructions about what to put up on the screen. Some of those instructions are what is the format, but other instructions say, go to this website and pull this image, or pull this soundtrack, or pull this text. And so you assemble a web page from literally anywhere in the internet. If we don't have full connectivity, that doesn't work. And that's why we need to maintain an unfragmented network to make all this function well. Now, I do have to take you back in time again to around 1973. Bob Kahn and I are trying to figure out, well, how is this going to work? How do we make these multiple networks interconnect? And our first question was, how many networks are there going to be? Now, remember, we were only thinking about the military command and control networks. So we thought, well, maybe there will be two networks per country, so there will be competition. And, and, and then we said, how many countries are there? And, and we didn't know the answer to that, and there wasn't any Google to ask back then. <laughs> so we guessed at 128, because that's a power of two, and that's how engineers think. 
So, okay, two times 128 is 256. So that's eight bits of network address. And then we said, how many computers will there be per network? And we thought, how about 16 million? That's two to the 24th. That's where the 32-bit IP version 4 address comes from. Now, over the course of history, we changed the interpretation of those bits. But at some point in 1992, we figured out that we were going to run out of address space. So a four-year uh, debate ensued, and we developed IP version 6. And by the way, if you're counting and you wonder what happened to IP version 5, that was an experiment in multicast communication that didn't scale very well, so we abandoned that. The next protocol number was 6. So IPv6, 128 bits of address space. That's 2 to the 128th addresses. I'll do the math for you. It's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. That's a number only the Congress can appreciate. Okay. So I used to go around saying, you know, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. That's enough addresses for every electron in the universe to have its own web page. And then I get an email from somebody at Caltech who says, Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there are 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and you're off by 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. Uh, but that's, we, I thought everybody would just immediately implement IPv6. But I have to remind you, it's 1996. What was happening in 1996? Did everybody here hear about this thing called the dot boom? Do you remember how that happened? Uh, Netscape Communications got mentioned a little earlier. It was founded in 1994, after the Mosaic browser was built by the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. Jim Clark, the founder of Silicon Graphics, saw Mosaic and said, this is a big deal. He grabs Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, and he brings them to the West Coast to start Netscape Communications. They go public in 1995, and the stock goes through the roof. The dot boom is on, and the venture capitalists are throwing money at anything that might have something to do with the Internet. That goes on for about four years. And some of those startup companies had CEOs that didn't know the difference between capital and revenue. Capital is finite. Revenue is supposed to keep going. So when they ran out of capital, the companies died, and so the landscape was littered with dead startups about the Internet. But a few of the companies that got started in that time frame survived, like uh, Google, uh, like Amazon, uh, well, Yahoo, not so much. <clears throat> but many of them have survived and thrived. Okay. Oh, yes. Well, this is just... Now, where, where else are we going? Now, this is something that I hope you can all really appreciate. Over the course of the last 40 or 50 years, use of computers to understand our world has dramatically increased. Today, it's common to hear new disciplines of the form computational X for every possible value of X that you can think of. Computational biology, astrophysics, linguistics, and biology, and all kinds of things. So we're really harnessing computer power to do research today. And of course, we've all been exposed to large language models, which are the latest version of artificial intelligence. Others are more, uh, are more manageable, like the machine learning models and things like that. We use very large neural networks at Google, uh, originally just to do things like game, playing games, like Go. These systems learn to play better than the humans did. But then we started using it for some other more practical applications. AlphaFold, for example, is a machine learning algorithm that takes uh, the protein sequences that are generated by interpreting DNA and figures out how the proteins fold up. And it's the shape of the protein that determines what it does. And so they managed to train this uh, alpha fold algorithm to create a catalog of 200 million proteins that could be produced by interpretation of human DNA. So we have this giant catalog now of all these proteins that could be produced in the uh, human body. 
that might lead us to solutions to various kinds of disease by interfering with disease processes that reuse these proteins for communication. And now, of course, in order to do all that computation, we have cloud computing systems like the ones at Amazon, at Microsoft, Google, and others. So uh, when you hear the word internet, it was about connecting networks together. I'm convinced at some point we're going to have to do inter-cloud, where we make the cloud service providers interoperate in a, as, a transparent way, the same way that we have done with the internet. There's, I'm going to kind of compress this because I want to get to a, a final set of points here. There's, data is everywhere and it is everything now. If you have data, you can create a great deal of insight if you know how to process it. So we have sensor data from many different places all around the world. We have financial data. We have medical data. We need more of that. And of course, a lot of this data is very sensitive, so we have to find ways of protecting it so that it only gets into the hands of authorized parties. So cryptography has become a very important part of the internet uh, uh, in, in addition to communications. But the thing that these, uh, these data offer to us is extraordinary insight into the way the world works, the way our bodies work, the way our financial systems work, the way our ecosystems work. All this data is beginning to allow us to form models of how things function so we can analyze and speculate about how we can manage them better. So we use the large language models for language translation, which, which we're doing right here today. Uh, we've used it also for speech recognition, speech generation. And of course, um, the LEO satellites, which are relatively recent, are bringing access to the internet to places where it would be very hard to reach. At some point, it may be impossible to avoid access to the internet with the low Earth orbiting satellites everywhere. So artificial intelligence is sort of on everybody's mind these days. And there were three phases, as I remember it. In the 60s, there were heuristic systems. And if, if it worked, it's engineering. If it doesn't work, it's artificial intelligence. So, so we had these heuristic systems with algorithms that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. Then we had expert systems where we would take knowledge from people's experts' heads and put them into if-then-else clauses. You know, if this condition exists, then you might have the following situation. And when you have hundreds of these rules, you could train the system to give you answers to complex questions. But it, the rule base got so big that sometimes the rules started to conflict with each other, so it didn't work all that well. Then, of course, came neural networks, which were frowned upon in the 1960s as ineffective. But when it became possible to build 100 or 500 layers of neural networks, suddenly the equation changed, and the drama, the drama that you see today is based on high-dimension, multi-layer neural networks. So I've already mentioned several of these uh, applications of large learning. But I do want to get into a bit more about some of the challenges that artificial intelligence is, is uh, posing for us. Now, one of the things that uh, people have done with the chatbots is simply entertainment. You give it a prompt, you ask it a question, and it generates text that comes out. And some of it's very creative. You could ask it to write an ode to a dandelion in the, sh in the style of Shakespeare, and, and it will do that. It's pretty astonishing. One of our vice presidents asked one of the chatbots to do a very simple task. He presented it with a string of random characters, and he asked the chatbot to reverse the string. And it did that. But then it said, oh, by the way, here's a Python program for doing that. Now, he didn't ask the system to write a program. The system decided to write a program for him. That was a big surprise. Now, there are, have we already heard about medical analysis, image analysis, that could be done at scale. That's the whole point that David was making earlier. We can do things at scale that we couldn't do using people. Uh, so this can be extremely powerful. However, we do have this problem of hallucinations in the large language models. 
And so um, I was testing this theory about the hallucinations. I decided to ask one of the chatbots to write an obituary for me. And I know that sounds kind of sad, but I thought, well, the system knows about um, obituary format because it has ingested obituaries from the internet. And so it knows what the format is. And I figured there's a little bit of information about me on the internet, so I thought it was a reasonable question. And indeed, it wrote a nice little 700-word obituary. We're sorry to say Dr. Surf passed away. And then it gave a date, which I thought was way too soon. I didn't <laughs> like that. And, and then it went on to my, my career and, and family members. But in, in the career section, it conflated things I did with things other people did. And when it got to the family member section, it made up family members that, as far as I know, I don't have. <laughs> and I remember thinking, how could it do that? And then I realized that these um, machine learning systems don't have context. So here's an example. David and I might have our bios on the same web page. And the training system is taking the text from both of those bios, and it doesn't know that this paragraph is about David and this paragraph is about Vint and it conflates the two together. So you can see how that could happen. We have work to do to try to not have that happen. And it's still a topic of uh, considerable research. So the way I look at this is that instead of trying to regulate the technology itself, what we should be doing is saying, let's be careful when we use these technologies for high-risk applications like medical diagnosis, medical treatment, financial advice. If you want to use them for entertainment, fine, no problem, except maybe for big arguments about intellectual property uh, and uh, you know, uh, copyright concerns. Uh, but we've already seen some fantastic things with real-time language translation, speech-to-text, uh, and image and sound synthesis. In fact, it's so good at this, that now we worry about fake images and fake sounds and fake movies and fake everything. Once again, that's going to require us to find a way of warning people ahead of time whether or not that which they are seeing has been artificially created. So I want to switch gears uh, in the last few minutes here and tell you about the solar system internet. Back in 1998, 97, a, uh, well, some of you may remember back in 1976, there were two rovers that landed on Mars uh, Viking 1 and Viking 2. That's 1976. And then for 20 years, nothing worked. They would burn up in the atmosphere, uh, crash, or miss the planet. But by 1997, the Pathfinder project from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory successfully landed on Mars. And do uh, you remember how they delivered it? It was a bouncing balloon. And all I could think of when I heard that was if I was the program manager at NASA and the engineers came in and said, hi, we're going to deliver your $6 million rover in a bouncing balloon, I would have thrown them out of my office. But it worked. So I immediately ran off to the Jet Propulsion Lab to meet with the team that was doing communications for that experiment. And we started talking about what we should be doing 25, uh, to be ready for what would be needed 25 years later. So it's 1998, we're asking ourselves, what do we have to have working by 2023? And so for the past 25 years, we have been working on the design and implementation of a solar system spanning internet. And interestingly enough, uh, when Spirit and Opportunity landed in 2004, the original plan was for the data to be transmitted from the rovers on the surface of Mars directly back to Earth to what's called the Deep Space Network. These are three 70-meter dishes in Canberra, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California. And the data rate was going to be 28.5 kilobits a second. And of course, the scientists were not happy about that, but we said that's the best we could do. Well, the radios overheated on the rovers, and they had to back off on the duty cycle, and now the scientists are really grumpy. But one of the engineers said, you know, there's an X-band radio on the rovers, and the orbiters that we sent two years before to map the surface of Mars are still functioning 
they have power, computing, and com communications capability, and they have an X-band radio. So we said, well, we have some prototype software, uh, and if you want to, we could upload it to the orbiters and the rovers, and NASA agreed to let us do that. So we uploaded software so that the rover would hang on to its data until an orbiter got overhead. And then it would squirt its data up to the orbiter, and the orbiter would hang on to the data until it got to the right place in its orbit to transmit the data to the deep space network. Now, because the orbiters are close by, the data rate between the rover and the orbiter was 128 kilobits a second. And because the orbiter was outside the Mars atmosphere with a bigger antenna and more power, it could transmit to the deep space network at 128 kilobits a second. So we built a store and forward network, that's packet switching, to support the uh, rovers in 2004. All of the rovers since then have used that same relay system. So that's a nascent interplanetary backbone system with just a few nodes in it. Today, we've been running the most recent protocols for interplanetary communication on the uh, International Space Station. We are going to be on the Artemis Return to the Moon mission. And we have a new suite of protocols. We're not using TCP IP because it doesn't work with a 40 minute round trip time to Mars. Uh, but the new protocol suite will function across the solar system. So by the 2030s, as we uh, return to the moon and possibly are on our way to Mars, we will have the technology available for a solar system spanning internet. What's very exciting about this is you've already noticed that we're starting to see commercialization happen. NASA has already given contracts to people who are planning to do mining on the moon. And, and they will sell the uh, results of the mining to NASA. And so we're starting to see already the possibility of commercial networks in space, just like the low Earth orbiting system we have today, as well as the uh, research networks. And so we're going to have to go through the same cycle we did with the internet to invent protocols and procedures and practices that will allow multiple parties to support the interplanetary network. And so I don't know about you, but I won't see the end of this, but I'm, it's sort of like I'm in chapter two of a 30-chapter 30, 30 novel. There's nothing more fun than being in at the beginning. And this is just the beginning of the next phase of the Internet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the current state of the Internet. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bueno, ahora quiero presentarles a dos miembros del panel que nos van a acompañar. Tengo entendido, no me he fijado, pero tengo entendido que tenemos ya varias preguntas. Espero que sigan poniendo las preguntas en el slide. Si hay preguntas de papel, por favor, con mucho gusto me las hacen llegar. Quiero entonces pedirle que suba aquí al panel a la señora Cintia Arias Leitón. Es la presidenta del Consejo Directivo de la Superintendencia de Telecomunicaciones de la SUTEL. Con una experiencia de más de 25 años que incluye los ámbitos de la regulación del mercado de las telecomunicaciones y la promoción de actividades productivas claves para el desarrollo de Costa Rica. Cintia es licenciada en Economía de la UCR y máster en Negocios Internacionales de la UCR Fundepos. También es egresada del Programa de Alta Gerencia del INCAE y profesora del Programa de Estudios de Posgrado de la Escuela de Economía de UCR. En la SUTEL ocupó el cargo de Jefa de Dirección General de Mercados por más de una década y lideró importantes proyectos como la Agenda Regulatoria Institucional y el Sistema de Estadísticas del Sector de Telecomunicaciones, que hoy está incorporado a las estadísticas nacionales, entre otros. Muchas gracias, Cintia, por acompañarnos. Y ahora tengo el agrado de pedirle a Guy de Teramón que nos acompañe. Pero se me perdió Guy. Guy obtuvo el doctorado 
en física a la Universidad de París en 1977. Ha realizado su investigación en física nuclear de altas energías y lideró el proyecto para establecer el nodo de la red de Bitnet de la Universidad de Costa Rica en noviembre de 1990. El proyecto fue seguido por la interconexión de Costa Rica a la red de Internet en enero del 93 y unos meses más tarde por el despliegue de la Red Nacional de Investigación, CRNET, en el marco de una colaboración con la Organización de Estados Americanos, la OEA, entre el 94 y el 97, logró con su equipo de ingenieros de la UCR la interconexión de Nicaragua, Panamá, Honduras, Jamaica, Guatemala, El Salvador y Belice al Internet. Unos años más tarde, impulsó desde el Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología la Red de Internet Avanzada del ICE para llevar la conectividad de banda ancha a través del país, proyecto que inauguró en el 2001. Finalmente, en el 2014, contribuyó al establecimiento de un punto neutro de intercambio de tráfico de Internet, CR y X, entre todos los operadores del país. Guy fue Guggenheim Fellow en el SLA National Accelerator Lab en la Universidad de Stanford del 86 al 88 y obtuvo el Wolfram Innovator Award en el 2020 por sus aportes a la física teórica y en el 2023 fue introducido al Salón de la Fama del Internet por su contribución al establecimiento del Internet en los países de Centroamérica y el Caribe. Muchas gracias, Guy, por acompañarnos. David, why don't you move over there so you can see the subtitles? Hopefully I won't be needing them. Preguntas de papel no hay. Bueno, entonces voy a tener que sacar las digitales. Yeah, that, you'll <laughs> never know that. <laughs> Same guy keeps sending me the wrong stuff. Miguel, mandame el, el link otra vez. Porque... Okay. Ah, está más grande eso. Mobile to the rescue. Muchas gracias. Ok, la primera pregunta dice de un señor que se llama Anónimo. ¿Por dónde empezar para reducir la brecha digital? ¿Infraestructura o alfabetización? ¿Can you follow? Uh, no, porque uh, this is going very slowly. Ok. So, should I go maybe, even slower? So, maybe you can go faster in English, okay. then, if you want. <laughs> Where do you start to break the digital divide? Yes. Do you do it infrastructure or learning? Oh, well, the original work was really infrastructure. I mean, we yeah, were... Yeah, but we have we, a, a digital divide. Most countries have a digital divide. Yes. So to start to close that divide, do you work with infrastructure? Do you work with oh, oh, oh. teaching? Well, you, you do you, have, you, do have you do to government? Do, yeah. do you... Um, listen, this is what's called a wicked problem. It's uh -huh. a hard problem. You can't solve the problem by just doing one thing. You need the infrastructure, otherwise you don't have a facility to communicate, but you need to know how to use it. You need to know how to operate it. You need to know how to design and build products that take advantage of the platform. So we have to have people who are trained in all of those various disciplines. They have to know how to set up a business model. They have to know how to create uh, monetization for sustainability. So this is like a really big picture puzzle where all the pieces have to be put together at the same time to get a result. So this is not just one thing. It has to be everything. Everything all at once. All, oh. Yes, everything all at once, all the time. Okay. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to opinar? Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos y es un gusto eh, compartir la mesa con tan renombrados personajes. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, bueno, yo creo y comparto la, la visión del señor eh, Cerf en el sentido de que tenemos una brecha digital gigantesca en el país, en el sentido de que hay necesidades múltiples, eh, que esas necesidades no están, eh, no son equivalentes entre las zonas urbanas y rurales. 
y por tanto eh, se requiere un, el desarrollo de una solución integral eh, que abarque no solamente un reto tan grande como el de la infraestructura, eh, un reto tan grande como el de promover el uso de la fibra óptica, un reto tan grande como el de generar las, los skills, las habilidades en las personas para poder, como el señor Cerf lo indica, eh, utilizar esas tecnologías eh, y cada vez que haya un uso cada vez más eh, amplio, no un uso y productivo, eh, requerimos también… Eh, la adopción de tecnologías nuevas eh, y esto es una carrera eh, de que no solamente tienen los operadores y proveedores de servicios, sino que también la regulación tiene que correr precisamente para poder regular eh, tecnologías que, van, que cambian más rápido de lo que, de lo que la, la, la regulación es posible que se adapte. Entonces, en realidad necesitamos sí este, actuar en todos los frentes y por eso yo llamo la atención en el caso, y sé que es muy diferente el tamaño del proyecto eh, de, de Irlanda, pero en el caso de Costa Rica tenemos un buen ejemplo de cómo se trabajan esos cinco, esos eh, diferentes eh, frentes, y es el caso de Fonatel, en donde tenemos cinco grandes grupos de, pro, de, pro, de programas, 34 proyectos, pero que abarcan desde lo que es la infraestructura hasta eh, el aprovisionamiento, el acceso, el tema de la asequibilidad, porque nada hacemos con que el servicio exista si no es accesible a todas las poblaciones eh, y entonces tenemos una respuesta integral a un problema eh, general que es el de la, eh, de la, de la brecha digital. Muchas gracias. ¿Y quieres opinar vos? No, solo, solo, solo complementar, porque no es solo la brecha. Se oye bien. Sí, pero tenés que hablarle al micrófono. No, no, no es solo la brecha entre ciudad, áreas rurales, etc. Eh, tenemos una brecha mucho más seria, que es entre eh, las, los, el sistema educativo momento el sistema de las escuelas privadas tiene una conectividad de primer mundo y eh, el sistema educativo público está básicamente, esencialmente desconectado. Tal vez sea un poco drástico decirlo de esa manera, pero es un problema que vamos eh, tropiezo tras tropiezo en los últimos eh, casi 25 años. Y eh, Hemos visto la importancia de educar a la gente más joven. Por ejemplo, la Fundación Omar Dengo hizo posible la industria del software en este país, porque los estudiantes hace 25 años en sus escuelas, en sus colegios eran entrenados, tenían acceso a las tecnologías. Este fue un proyecto pionero en el mundo. En este momento tenemos la realidad de buena parte de los estudiantes de las escuelas públicas básicamente desconectados o al menos no tener el acceso que deberían tener comparado con las escuelas privadas de manera que ese es un punto que va a tener consecuencias muy serias en, la so en el desarrollo de la sociedad si no, si no lo hacemos en, en conjunto si no lo resolvemos en, en conjunto podría hablar mucho más de posibles soluciones, eh, sé que, que su tele ha estado muy activo en, es, en esta área y, y maneja un fondo muy importante, pero creo que es un problema que debe ser resuelto en forma de país, no de una iniciativa CAP y una iniciativa separada por ahí. Muchas gracias. Uh, David, do you want to opine? Well, on the same question. Yeah, the same question. The digital divide, I mean, you got to do everything all at once. Or is there anything that's more important, or how would you tackle it? Well, I, th I think Ireland is a good example of how we tackled it. Um, it's a, it's a, as Vint said, it's a very, very, I would say more than complex, expensive. Okay, fair I would say it's an expensive, in most economists, when they look at 
the expense of something, they don't take everything into consideration. You and I have had this conversation before. You need to take into consideration how much more you can do to educate the population. You need to take into consideration how much you can lower the health care costs. You need to take into consideration all these other externalities that normal economics don't. Uh, and then once you get your head around that, I think you have to, as Vince said, you have to do it all. But you, you, you have to start on the physical fiber as soon as possible because you can get left behind if you don't. If a country, the more, the farther away from the center you are, the more critical it is for you. And it, there are so many talented people in rural parts of Costa Rica, Ireland, any other country, that can contribute to the solutions of the problems we all face. So I think, I think Vint has it right. You have to do them all at once, but you have to swallow hard and realize it's expensive, but in the long run, it makes you more competitive. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Cerf from Victor. Did you ever imagine the impact your work would have on the world? Well, to be really honest, uh, if I said no, I'm sure you'd all believe me, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's exactly right. Remember, this is a 50-year odyssey, and so I have lived through all those 50 years, uh, a spoonful at a time. And so the, the realization that this was going to be a really, really big deal was slow to dawn on me. Uh, it was um, 1988, I remember, one very specific incident that really caused me to recognize this was going to be a big deal. Um, I was walking into an exhibition called Interop. 50,000 people had come to see equipment and software working together in an internet environment using a big uh, ethernet cable. Everyone was connected to the cable and they were showing how all of their software and, and hardware would interwork using the TCP IP protocols. And so I walked into this e exhibit hall with Eric Benamou, who was the CEO of 3Com, a company that was making Ethernet. And I, I turned to e Eric and I said, Eric, how much do these big two-story displays cost? And he said, a quarter of a million dollars. And um, this is 1988 when a quarter of a million dollars was a lot of money. And I said, my God, People must think that they're going to make money on the internet. <laughs> and, and then I started thinking, well, how is the general public and the private sector going to get access to it? Because in 98, the appropriate use policy, which I've already told you about, was still in force. And that's what caused me to go off and try to make, okay. make a, build a commercial fire under the uh, government-sponsored internet. So I would say around 1988, I realized that this was going to be a big deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question for David from Jorge Mora from Akamai. David, recently we, Costa Rica, were compared as the next Silicon Valley of Latin America. What would your advice be to Costa Rica to be part of the game? Um, I, th I think repeating what someone else has done is not nearly as impactful as creating something new. So we have one Silicon Valley, and it's done a pretty good job. And what made Silicon Valley special at the time is the technologists and the money were there. The money has since been willing to go anywhere, and you have, can access the technology from anywhere. So the world doesn't really need another Silicon Valley. What it needs is countries that are willing to spend the money to make sure that everyone has connectivity and decide what they want to be specialist in. And Costa Rica right now is a specialist on the environment. The rest of the world looks at Costa Rica. Tourists come here to look at 
the environment because they're in art what you've done. And I think that a different version, dare I say, maybe it could be a better version of Silicon Valley is what Costa Rica should try to do, in my opinion. And, and you don't have the disadvantage of being a small country. That if there's one thing I said that earlier that's worth repeating, big countries are getting smaller, small countries need to get bigger, and size doesn't matter anymore. Educated people and connectivity and a desire matters, but size doesn't matter anymore. So, so let me amplify that by making one other important observation. Once you have access to the internet, even if it's only a portion of the country, you have the opportunity to serve the world's demand for information technology. You're not confined to serving only the domestic um, uh, consumers. And so even if you don't have a fully networked country, you still can make use of that part, which is networked, to produce products and services that you can deliver through the internet to anywhere in the world. And so a small country has as much of an opportunity as anyone else to deliver information technology products and services. Thank you. Ustedes quisieran opinar el asunto del, del Silicon Valley? Regresando un poco a la pregunta anterior, yo creo que tenemos la capacidad de hacerlo. Tenemos eh, una, el, el, el señor McCord mencionaba al inicio eh, las ventajas o que en un país, en un país pequeño necesitan ser grandes. Eh, tenemos personas educadas, que está bien, tenemos que mejorar esa educación pero tenemos una base de conocimiento que nos permite desarrollar esos skills, esas, esas habilidades tecnológicas para dar un, un salto. Eh, tenemos todo para desarrollar un país en donde la economía de la mente, como mencionaba el señor, eh, el señor McCord, de Don David, eh, pueda desarrollarse. Eh, pero ciertamente necesitamos resolver problemas antes y por eso me llamaba mucho la atención eh, el caso de Irlanda, eh, en donde ellos eh, mencionaban, duraron 10 años en despegar con este proyecto y resolviendo problemas de orden político más que técnico. Y aquí yo creo que en Costa Rica eh, eh, es eso lo que nos hace falta dar ese paso, dejar de pensar en una visión de corto plazo, tener una visión de largo plazo, tener una visión de desarrollo, no de gobiernos, sino de desarrollo de Estado, una visión país. Y, y como bien lo señalaba también Don Gui, eh, el tema de la educación es la base para poder hacer, hacer esto. Y bueno, tenemos también la posibilidad de a través de la tecnología continuar potenciando ese valor tan importante como es el tema de la conservación del medio ambiente, ¿verdad? no solamente porque son, ten, son industrias no intensivas en el uso de, de recursos naturales, eh, intensivas en conocimiento, pero también podemos a través de la tecnología seguir atrayendo nómadas digitales, seguir atrayendo inversiones eh, en estos temas. Entonces, eh, creo que tenemos todo para hacer ese ese Silicon Valley nuevo. ¿Y qué crees? ¿No querés opinar de Silicon Valley? Sí, sí yo estoy, yo, nadie me ha preguntado, pero es extraño, era como alguien termina sentado en un panel sin que lo inviten. Pero, este, sí, Silicon Valley, no sé si ustedes, bueno, los afiliados del club recuerdan que en el año 99 hicimos un tour, fuimos 30 miembros del club, del club, la gran mayoría eran jefes de cómputo, directores de sistemas, etc. Fuimos a Silicon Valley, que estuvimos, Nacho, como dos semanas. Y el, el, la conclusión obvia es que estaban todos locos, están chiflados, totalmente fuera de sus casillas. ¿no? <risa> El, el, el chofer del bus que nos llevaba de un lugar a otro, en vez de poner música en el radio, ponía la bolsa de valores. Están totalmente obsesionados. ¿verdad? 
Y, y yo, no, yo no quiero algo así para Costa Rica. O sea, dicen que eh, Silicon Valley es una mezcla divina de talento y capital. Y que es la capital del mundo, del talento y capital. Eh, yo no sé, pero esa obsesión con el dinero que tienen en Silicon Valley... O sea, yo conocí un maje en, en, ahí donde está el lugar ese de la NASA, donde está... Eh, bueno, anyway, este, estaba deprimido porque solo tenía 50 millones de dólares en el banco. Y sus amigos todos tenían 200 y 300. Eh, eso, no, eso no es vida. Yo, realmente yo no quiero eso para Costa Rica. Nunca. Yo sé que nadie me preguntó, pero bueno, disculpen. <risa> Aquí hay una pregunta sobre el Web3. Would you like to comment on Web3? Is it just a fade, a fad? Or do you see, more, is it more than a gimmick? Do you see something in it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear Web3. The Web3. The question is, do you think that Web3 is a fad? Oh, Web3. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh yeah. okay. Sorry, I'm hearing impaired, so he's doing his best. Um, Web3 is... Um, an advertising slogan, as far as I can tell. It's not really a, a substance. Uh, certainly, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, is very upset when people call it Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3 because he doesn't think that way. So depending on your definition of Web 3, it could be a success and it could be a failure. If Web 3 means 3D holographic uh, you know, game playing, It's not clear that's a big success. But if Web3 turns out to be about assembling information in, and processing it in powerful ways, sharing information to make progress, like in medical research, then Web3 may actually turn out to be a, a blazing success. But I think it depends on what you define Web3 to be. Dale, sí, claro. Tal vez para añadir a, la, a, la, a tu Ajá. comentario, que, que me gustó mucho, bueno, me tocó vivir varios años en, en, es, en ese ambiente, ¿no? eh, de manera que comparto mucho tu, tu apreciación. Pero hay algo que recuerdo que eh, Bint eh, lo invitamos hace 25 años a la conferencia inaugural de la Universidad de Costa Rica, de la Facultad de Ciencias. Eso fue en antes, mil novecientos, cerca del año 2000, y estaba el gran auditorio de la facultad. En, en ese momento la Internet estaba creciendo en, en este país. Eh, después se convertiría en, en una industria, o sea, la, el, el capital alrededor de, del Internet son, son trillones de dólares. Y uno de los puntos que me llamó mucho la atención eh, es que todo está basado, como lo pudimos ver en los protocolos TCP y IP, la invención de Vint y, y Bob Kahn, que por cierto es algo absolutamente extraordinario, se podría hablar por horas y horas, hay un montón de consecuencias matemáticas, por ejemplo, de por qué son ideales, por qué Internet se ha multiplicado en un factor de un millón o simplemente porque son, son es una escala. Cualquier otra tecnología se hubiera caído y la magia la hace el protocolo TCP. Pero eso podríamos hablar eh, en otra ocasión. Pero lo que me llamó la atención en, es, en esa presentación de Vint, que lo hice público, es el hecho precisamente que Vint y Khan hubieran podido eventualmente patentar su, su invención pero no lo hicieron, fue una donación a la humanidad que ha permitido cambiar el mundo. De manera que muchas veces el no andar detrás de, de, de millones posiblemente hace un individuo de la talla, de la estatura y de la influencia de alguien como Vint, que estamos muy agradecidos y muy orgullosos que nos visite por segunda vez. Yeah, he was saying that uh, Hint and Bob could have patented TCPAP and probably make gazillions out of it, but they chose to donate it to humanity. 
and thank you so much for that. Okay. Oh. Wind. Paul asks, what research excites you today? I'm sorry. What research? Oh, am I? Yeah, what excites you? Well, actually, I told you about the interplanetary network, yeah. so that's one project. By the way, just to make it clear, that's not a Google project. This is something I'm doing uh, outside of Google. They just let me do that, so just so you don't get the wrong idea. Uh, there's another project that I've been working on uh, since a TED Talk in 2013. It's called the Interspecies Internet. And my uh, colleagues, Peter Gabriel, the famous musician, uh, Neil Gershenfeld, who is a uh, scientist at MIT, an engineer like me, and Diana Rice, who is studying cognition in um, dolphins, uh, at um, the University up in New York. I'm sorry, I just drew a blank Columbia. on the, uh, Columbia. Yeah, the hmm? Columbia. Columbia, thank you. Duh. Columbia University. So four of us got together and we gave a TED talk saying, you know, we think that non-human species have the capacity to think and to imagine and to communicate. Now, their ability to do that may be less than that of the human species, but it's not absent. There is cognition there. So we began to ask ourselves, how could we demonstrate this ability of non-human species to communicate either with other humans or with, uh, with other non-human species? And that we thought, well, the, often it's the case that the species in question might not be co-located, like the dolphins may be near the shore and the elephants might be somewhere in the interior, so, or the apes. So we thought, well, maybe we could just use the internet to transfer the signals from the dolphins to the elephants and vice versa. Of course, each of the species would have to have some way of signaling. Some of them can make sound, some of them might have to use artifacts, for example, a touch panel. And so our dolphin expert designed a touch panel to be used underwater by the dolphins that could touch it with their, with their noses to signal their intent. And then we would take that information and we would transfer it across the internet to a waiting great ape who wanted to have a conversation with the dolphin. Well, we haven't got to the point where the dolphins and the apes are talking to each other um, because we're even not sure what the dolphins are saying to each other, let alone what they would say to an elephant. But we also, because of the, the progress that's being made with the large language models, we're also imagining that the internet in the middle could be more than just a, a transmission, a transmitter of signals we could conceivably take the dolphin signals and try to understand it through a large language model and translate it into a signal that the apes and the elephants might understand. And maybe someday humans could t speak to non-human species that way. So we're still at the very early stages of experimenting with all this. But for me, it's very exciting because it's very clear that these non-human species have evolved intelligence of some level. And so the possibility of understanding their communication, for me anyway, is very exciting. So that's just another one of the things I have fun being involved in. Thank you. Thank you. I got a question here from Chris Music. He says that the internet was born in the government, so it was free. AI is born on the private companies and must charge for it. How do we ensure that AI does not make the digital divide worse? You want to take that one, David? Sure. Well, <clears throat> AI, I don't know if it's five years from now or 10 years from now, but 
AI is going to be everywhere. So there'll be people and companies that use AI, and there'll be people and companies that don't exist. I mean, everyone will use AI to some, to some extent. And there'll be, because of the way the web is designed, all these big tech companies that Bint was mentioning all started as little tiny startups. Yeah. Some of them survived and, and, and some did. There'll be a new collection and class of AI companies that won't all be owned by the big tech companies. There'll be, there'll be new, smaller companies. I think the important thing and AI only works because it lays on top of, of the internet. Otherwise, it, it, it's just an application on, on, on top of the internet. What's important is that we're using this new um, tool, thank you, this new tool to solve the problems that we all share. We all share uh, problems of education is too expensive, healthcare is too expensive, waiting lines, for, for national health in all countries are too long. AI can solve those problems if people put their mind towards and agree that we want to solve those problems. Uh, and it's not short term. You're, I couldn't translate the Spanish of, of what the answer is about in Ireland, how it took. It took 10 years, but if it took 10 years in Ireland, it should take two or three in Costa Rica because you can learn from our mistakes. You can learn from the mistakes we made that took us so long to get that project off the ground. And now it's turning out that not only is it not costing as much as we thought it was going to cost, what we're going to do to rethink education, what we're going to do to rethink healthcare, what we're going to do to rethink the environment where people have to work and how much they have to use the roads and housing prices in urban areas will go down because people will be able to live in rural areas. All that has to go into the equation when governments make a decision on connectivity. And AI is part of our solution. It's not our only solution, but it's part of the solution to all these problems. Vince, do you have a open well, I'm opinion? Just, I'm just thinking about uh, our experience. Artificial intelligence tools are already openly available for in many places. And so I think that we're just going to see a proliferation of research and experimentation uh, with these uh, techniques. And as we understand them better, they will become increasingly accessible. I just think for one moment about some of the most expensive technologies uh, ever built. Let's take computers as an example. When the first ones were built, they cost millions of dollars. And some of them occupied rooms full of equipment. And then as time has gone on, and we've learned how to make these less expensive and smaller, eventually they end up in our wristwatches in our implants uh, and in our mobiles. And so the artificial intelligence technologies will probably follow the same path. We've started out having to build big data centers to do these huge training programs that last for days, if not weeks. But as time goes on, I am convinced that this will become less and less necessary. We're, we're learning about what are called uh, single shot or small shot models, uh, models with a smaller number of parameters that can do almost as well as the very big expensive ones. So over time, I think this will become much more ubiquitous. Thank you. Does anyone want to be done? No. Okay. I just have a question. Um, how can you be sure that through the political decisions related to uh, artificial intelligence, a uh, digital divide is not going to increase. Uh, be, I am asking that mm -hmm. because in Costa Rica next week, I, I think next week or the, the, the next, in two, follow one, week, the yeah. following week, um, the minister is going to present the uh, artificial yes. intelligence yes. policy. Yes. Yes, you, are, you have put your finger on a classic problem in uh, advanced technologies where there is uncertainty about the safety of the, of the technology. And so artificial intelligence already has demonstrated that it can make mistakes. I hope, though, that the regulators and the policymakers 
don't make the mistake of preventing us from learning how to make these tools work reliably. To do that, we need to try things out. The real issue is making sure that we don't try them out on people who are unaware of the risk factors. We want people to know that sometimes these tools will not work correctly. So we need to protect them, not by not using the tools and not experimenting with them, but by not using them inappropriately. Warning people ahead of time that if you go to this chatbot for financial advice, you may be making a mistake. So I would like the risk factor to be the key element here. And let's pretend for a moment that you've got this great idea for a new AI application, and you decide that you want to go start a company to pursue that. And uh, the, the regulator over here, Roberto, is looking at your proposals and thinking, I wonder how much damage she's going to do to the population in Costa Rica. And so he comes to you and he says, look, I think that you need to show me, the regulator or the policymaker, what steps you've taken to protect the general public from abusing your technology or being harmed by it. But if you can show due diligence, then he might allow you to pursue that. And in the research environment, we are fairly open to allowing people to try things out. But the worst thing would be for legislators and policymakers to fear this so much that they quench the fire. To use an analogy, I mean, if fire has been brought to us, we should learn how to use it, not put it out. Bueno, yo creo que so, tengo demasiadas preguntas y muchas sed. Por lo tanto, hay varias preguntas acerca de la seguridad del Internet, cómo mantener la seguridad del Internet. Eh, es un problema, pues no sé, ¿quieres opinar de eso aquí? Mejor no usarla, ¿sí vos? <risa> ok, ok. No, este, eh, quería agradecerles a todos los remotos y los presentes la participación. Yo espero que mañana podamos tener los slides de Vint y el video de todo lo que hicimos hoy en el sitio del club, donde pueden accederlo, queda disponible para todos. Y ahora sí quiero pedirles encarecidamente que nos acompañen a tomarnos un vinito y tal vez comernos una boquita y podemos conversar entre todos y decidir cómo hacer la Internet más segura y cómo hacer eh, Costa Rica sea mejor que Silicon Valley. Muchísimas gracias a Vint y a David. Guy, Cynthia. Shall we? Yes, thank you. I thought it was first.